Thank, thank you very much. Um, I never thought um, I would write a book when uh, the publishers came to see me two and a half years ago in, in my offices in Two Bedford Row in London and uh, put to me the proposal that has ended up um, with this book under the wig. Um, the book itself is unusual. It is certainly not a standard autobiography. And if it was going to be that, I don't think I would have agreed to write it. The purpose of the book is to really demystify the profession of being a barrister to the layman. Um, it explains how you become a barrister, how you qualify, how you join a set of chambers, which is what we call our officers, um, how you develop a practice, how you prepare a case, how you prepare questions, <coughs> win the confidence of a judge, how you might become a QC, how you might become a judge, and so on. And it does it in a way that hopefully makes it digestible to people who really have little or no idea about how the law works. I think in order to make the book um, slightly more attractive uh, as a commercial venture, um, <laughs> they've interspersed every chapter with a, another chapter in which um, I have talked about one of the cases that I've been involved in over the years that um, people will um, often remember and, and which for one reason or another um, is um, of general interest. Um, they include, for example, those with uh, long memories, the murder of Rachel Nickell on Wimbledon Common when I defended a man called Colin Stagg who was charged and found not guilty of her murder. and. Um, very unusually, my defense of the man who had actually committed that murder for another murder um, where he murdered a, a, a mother and child very near Plumstead Common a few years later. Um, there was the shooting of Jill Dando, the um, TV presenter of the holiday program and, and Crime Watch, um, the Chillington murders, the murder of Dr. Lynn Russell and her daughter and the attempted murder of the second daughter, Josie Russell, who made a miraculous recovery from the injuries. Um, and cases that I've done with um, Rough Justice, a program that worked on BBC, trying to um, correct miscarriages of justice. One quite amusing case involving a man being convicted on the basis of an earprint, um, which was um, completely and utterly debunked in a subsequent um, trial where he was found um, to be not guilty. Um, the trial of Private Clegg, paratrooper in Northern Ireland in the Troubles, who was convicted of murder when the patrol that he was on was driven at by a stolen car at high speed and they opened fire and the backseat passenger was killed and the forensic evidence that ultimately turned that trial, again in a retrial situation, um, to result in a verdict um, of not guilty, and, and some war crimes trials that I may talk about um, a little later. So that is the sort of um, way the book is set out. And um, reverting to the sort of theme of today's talk, murder, um, I've defended in my career over a hundred people charged with murder. And I presume that the first question um, really to ask is um, who is likely to kill you? Um, <laughs> statistically, it is not going to be the stranger in the street grabbing you on the way home and killing you or a man or woman breaking into your house with a sawn-off shotgun to commit a burglary and shooting you. The person most likely to kill you is your partner, your parent, or your child. And that is, I'm afraid, a statistical fact. <laughs> Murder by stranger is actually very rare. 
They are, in fact, for us lawyers, the most interesting cases um, because so often murder in the family um, doesn't require a great deal of detective work to solve. Uh, and hence, um, they don't provide for a challenge so far as uh, us lawyers are concerned. So um, the ones that we find interesting, indeed the ones in this book, are um, all but one, I think, um, examples of stranger murders. But statistically, they are very rare. Why do people um, commit murder? Having reflected very much on a hundred plus murders that I have defended, most murderers, most people who kill, have no previous convictions of any kind. They are not people who've been in trouble with the police in the past. They haven't been stealing and fighting during the course of their life. Most occasions, they are people who have just snapped for one reason or another and struck out with terrifying results. And I do subscribe to a theory that it is within all of us the power to commit murder. And everybody here will say, of course, yeah, but I would never do it. Um, they look at the chap next door and think, I'm not quite sure about him. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would never do it. Whatever the strains and stresses were in my life, um, I would never um, kill another human being. I'm afraid the, the evidence um, tends to suggest um, to the contrary. For my part, at any rate, um, and I put the mentally ill to one side, who undoubtedly do feature significantly in murder statistics, um, putting them to one side, uh, I, I can, for my part, sympathise, although not condone, of course, the plight of a single mother bringing up a child in a bedsit, driven mad by a child screaming all night, who shakes the child until the child stops because it stops breathing. I can also understand, but not condone, sorry, <coughs> um, understand but not condone the attraction to an unemployed black boy who has no qualifications, seeking peer approval by carrying a knife in a gang where he feels belonged and perhaps respected for the only time um, in his life. But I think the best demonstration of the fact that it is within the power of all of us to commit murder is, is to look at what has happened in the field of war crimes. Um, for, for my um, practice uh, has involved defending people accused of war crimes, both committed in the Second World War and in the Balkans conflict. Um, I think it was in 1991 that Parliament in this country passed the War Crimes Act. Um, it, Mrs Thatcher was the Prime Minister. Uh, she was an enthusiast of, of, of the Act. She had a constituency in North London with a high Jewish population who were bringing pressure on her to try war criminals in this country who were still alive and had been named by the Simon Wiesenthal Center as war criminals, but were living here um, completely uh, safe from prosecution because our law does not allow us to try extraterritorial offenses unless statute so provides. So for example, take a simple case, if you go shoplifting in Paris, you can't be tried in London you could be tried in Paris. If I go and punch somebody on the nose in Berlin, I commit a crime in Berlin, I commit no crime here. And so it applies with murder. If you go and murder somebody in Poland, then you've committed a murder there. That's where the crime is committed. You haven't committed any crime here. You can't be tried here. Of course, the trouble with the war crimes was that the majority of the crimes that concerned people in this country had been committed in that corridor between 
the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, down through Poland into Belarus and Ukraine, that were a corridor that was invaded by the Nazis during the Second World War and which had a high Jewish population following from the expulsion of the Jews from Russia by, I think it was Peter the Great. So there was a, a, a significant corridor um, of um, Europe that did have quite a significant Jewish population. And for historic reasons, quite a few of the people involved in those killings ended up in London. And I'll explain why a little later, because it's a curious um, story in itself. And they, of course, could not be prosecuted here because the crime had been committed in Belarus or Poland. And they couldn't be prosecuted there because when the Iron Curtain was up, there was no question of any um, extradition um, in relation to those countries at all. And indeed, they would probably not be liable to extradition because you can't extradite somebody who is <coughs> going to face the death penalty in the country to which they are going unless there is a, a copper bottom guarantee by that government that they will not be executed. So they had been living here uh, quite normally since the Second World War and were then already old men. The first man um, to be arrested for war crimes was a man called Simeon Serovanovich. And um, I came to represent him um, by pure chance. Um, a solicitor who used to instruct our chambers with fairly mundane um, cases um, had an article clerk, somebody training to be a solicitor, who was playing snooker in a snooker hall in Dorking in Surrey. And uh, the chap on the next table said to him, um, you're a solicitor, aren't you? To which he untruthfully said yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, he said, my dad's in a bit of trouble. Um, do you think you could possibly help him? To which he said, yeah, all right. What's he charged with? He said, genocide. <laughs> 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 so that, that brought the game to a fairly rapid end. And, um, it wasn't long after that that um, Simeon Serovanovich rolled up in my office. And um, just reading from the book, um, Serovanovich was the Belarusian police commander in the small town of Mir. He had somehow managed to engineer himself a reason to be away from Mir on the day the Einsatzgruppen massacred the town's Jews, though he would have been responsible for deploying his officers who were present. Instead, he was charged with four counts of murdering Jews in 1941 during the so-called mopping up operations conducted by the Belarusian police on Nazi orders. Now, j just pausing <coughs> there, what, what had happened was that the Nazi had, Nazis had put into place something that was unbelievably called the final solution. And the final solution was a plan to murder every Jew in Eastern Europe. And that was to be achieved by having the Einsatzgruppen, that was a specialist squad of soldiers, move slowly from village to village, from town to town, and literally round up all the Jews who then had already been confined in ghettos and were required to wear clothes with a yellow star on for easy identification, march them out of the village or town to an open space where normally a pit had been dug, herd them to the pit and machine gun them, put, get them all into the pit, fill it in, and then move on to the next town or village. Now this horrifying, almost unbelievable practice was going on day after day after day. And the Belarusian local police force came into it in the following way because word was getting round to the Jews in the ghettos what was going to happen. Some thought it was just ludicrous um, rumors and couldn't possibly be true. Others could see the way life was going and believed it. 
and some would hide. Um, we had witnesses in the case who had taken the floorboards up of their house and got the children and themselves under the floorboards and got other people to nail them down again um, so that when they did the sweep through, there was no sign of them. And then obviously afterwards they would break out and um, try to uh, see if they could survive the war. The role of the Belarusian police was that once the Einsatz group had then moved on to the next village, that they were um, given the task of mopping up, as it was called. Um, in other words, any Jew that was found who had survived the um, first massacre would be shot by the local police, and then thereby ensuring the uh, successful outcome, as they saw it, of the final solution. I inevitably, um, some Jews did survive. Um, one uh, remarkably passed himself off as a Gentile and worked in the German cavalry stables um, for most of the rest of the year. And when finally unmasked as a Jew and put into a cell to await execution, a German officer went and left the door open to allow him to escape. Um, another found refuge in a convent and spent the whole of the remainder of the law in hiding in a convent. Many more went into the woods and lived um, a terribly hard, primitive life um, in the woods with partisans who were already there, who were primarily <coughs> communists, and um, fought the Germans from there, and a number of them also survived. And these people were still alive in the 1990s and early 2000s, and were able to come over here um, to give evidence. But um, picking up um, Serevanovich's position, um, instead he was charged with four counts of murdering Jews in 1941 during the so-called bopping up operations conducted by the Belarusian police on Nazi orders. By the time the Nazi death squads got to Mir, quite a number of the town's Jews, having got word of the impending roundup, had fled into the for <coughs> forests or hidden under the floorboards of their houses. As a result, quite a few survived the massacre. When they later discarded their yellow-starred clothing, they believed they were safe because the Nazis had no way of knowing whether they were Jewish or not. But they were unaware that the local police had been enlist enlisted to identify any Jews left after the massacre and eliminate them. Amazingly, some lived to tell the tale. Survivors remained in the forests for three years many joining existing partisan groups of communist sympathizers who'd escaped the Nazis and some forming their own partisan groups. Others concealed themselves in the weave of ordinary life. One man who was herded to the death pits toppled unscathed into the pit as everyone around him was cut to shreds by machine gun fire and was covered in as the pit was filled in. Later that night, he dug himself out from under the dead bodies and survived the war. It was um, a remarkable case to be involved in and provided a very um, keen insight in, into what was it that made the police um, participate in those mopping up operations. Um, Serevinovich himself, Serevinovich himself um, was called the commander of the local police force. In, in truth, he was little more than the station sergeant. It was quite a small town. And he had ensured that he was not in the town on the day of the Einsack group had massacre and had made sure that he was elsewhere, perhaps indicating a desire to distance himself from that awful event. He certainly couldn't stop it, and any attempt to stop it would have had him shot, without a doubt. Um, in the aftermath, the evidence was that he had participated in some of the cleaning up operations largely under German supervision, 
and had gone out to villages where locals were shot. The position was that when the Nazis originally invaded Belarus, they were looked upon by liberators as many of the um, by many of the locals because before that they had been under Russian occupation and, and they were an extremely harsh occupying force and had shot and sent to work um, labour camps many of the so-called intellectuals in the village, doctors and people like that who for some reason were perceived to be anti-communist were all um, shipped off so the original German invasion was seen as a liberation. <coughs> Views soon changed. They were out of the frying pan um, into the fire. But those who had been sympathetic to the communists were promptly shot by the Nazis when they arrived. And going on in history, when the Russians then reinvaded, anybody who'd been sympathetic to the Nazis was then shot by the Russians. So if ever there was a time to be neutral, it was undoubtedly then. Um, and <clears throat> one is with Serovinovich in a case where he was a perfectly ordinary police sergeant who before the war was busy investigating whether one farmer had stolen some chickens from another one and wh who had managed to butcher so-and-so's cow. A and that was the extent really of his um, role in the community. There was never any question that he had any anti-Semitic uh, beliefs or anything like that. He was just an ordinary policeman. When the Germans invaded, had he not um, complied with their directions, he would undoubtedly have been shot. So, in a way, faced with that um, awful dilemma, well, what he did was to follow orders and to ensure that at least some of those who were Jews who had survived the um, original massacre were in fact executed. But it's an illustration and the first today of somebody who would never have committed any crime at all in his life were it not for the circumstances in which fate placed him in. And I don't think anybody can actually say how we would have acted in those circumstances because we've never been put in those circumstances. It's easy now to say, well, of course, they would have done it. They could have shot me, but I wouldn't have done it. But can anybody here actually imagine the sort of questions that people like him had to address and answer. Of course, when he was uh, arrested here, um, we were then put in the position of investigating crimes that had happened nearly 50 years before. And so much of the facts of what had happened had become part of local folklore, being told and retold a thousand times. And how much was a reflection of those stories and how much was actually genuine memory, um, it was difficult to ascertain. But um, I certainly had to cross-examine an elderly pensioner on the basis that when he was 13 years old, looking out of a window, he might have been mistaken as to who he had seen parading seven Jews <coughs> to what was ultimately their execution. How reliable the memory of a 13-year-old child was when he was then an elderly pensioner um, is um, something I'm still very um, unhappy about. Serenovich ended up in England um, in a rather curious way because when the fortunes of war turned and the Germans were in retreat from the Russian front, it became perfectly obvious to those um, in Belarus that the Russians would be back sooner rather than later because they could see the <coughs> retreating army of Germany. And there is no doubt at all that if the Germans had got into Mir and Serovinovich was still there, they'd have shot him. 
because he would have been down as a Nazi sympathizer, uh, as indeed they shot all the other policemen who had not escaped. So by a circuitous route um, through um, Austro Austria and Hungary um, and Italy, he managed to get um, to the Allied front and joined the um, Italian army that was then fighting, although Mussolini was originally on the other side, there was in fact a brigade that was fighting with the Allies and ended up fighting the Germans in North Italy. And after that, um, he was um, allowed to come here and, and indeed did come here as did many others who could not of course have gone back to Belarusia to his home because he'd have just been shot. So um, he came here and, and worked as a carpenter until he retired and had never committed any criminal offence in this country at all, thereby perhaps demonstrating that this is not somebody who, without the pressure of the extraordinary predicament that he was placed in, would have ever offended. Um, he sadly never stood trial. I say sadly because I think there was a reasonable chance he would have been found not guilty because he had done quite a lot to mitigate the local population um, against the um, Nazis and had negotiated with them for people to be saved who were due to be executed and so on. And when I went to Belarus, I found a woman who still prayed for him every day for saving the life of her husband. Um, he sadly developed uh, Alzheimer's before the case could be heard and was found unfit to stand trial and died very shortly afterwards. Um, and that caused a slight change in approach by the prosecution because they had picked him out of the potential war criminals because <coughs> they felt he was in a position of command. Um, and they didn't want to just go for a private in the army and prosecute him. They wanted somebody who was in a position of command to make the, the process worthwhile in their eyes. And I can see the logic of that. Of course, by the time the case was over, it dawned on them that anybody in a position of command was likely to be in their 90s. And as likely as not, they'd be the same problem with health as they had with Serenovich. So the, the next chap they tried was a chap called um, Anthony Sawoniuk, who, who was known as uh, Andrusha the Bastard. And um, that is indeed the title of the chapter um, about him <coughs> in, in the book. And he was um, called that because um, that is um, how he was known in, in his village um, in Belarus. Um, he was um, from an extremely poor family um, with no father, hence the um, name. And his mother made a, a, a pittance of a living doing washing for other families um, in the village. They had no um, land, so unlike many others, they were not able to um, scratch a living from the soil. Um, he, he had been um, badly bullied at school. And when the Germans invaded, um, he was then, I think, 17 years old. And when they asked for volunteers to join the police force, um, he volunteered. He'd never had any employment before. And it, it must have seen to him that this was a, a golden opportunity to um, Im improve his lifestyle. The first time in his life, he was given a purpose, he was given a salary, and he was given a gun. Um, and he became a very officious policeman, that much was clear, um, getting his own back on all the people who'd been bullying him for years, um, and became very unpopular in the village. A and here, I'm afraid, did take, um, so it would appear, to the task of um, rounding up any surviving um, Jew from the massacre in his village with a great deal more enthusiasm than uh, Serovanovich. But I mean, I think that uh, perhaps reflected um, somebody who was very much influenced by the propaganda of the time. He was not an intelligent man at all. Serovanovich was a perfectly um, intelligent individual. He was, I'm afraid, um, rather stupid. Um, and um, 
was eventually convicted of two counts of murder following his trial and sentenced to prison for life. But rather like Serovanovich, he had lived here working, in fact, for the um, London Underground ever since 1946 until his retirement, never committed any offence, never been shoplifting, never punched anyone on the nose, never done anything at all or anything before the war. But again, circumstance had involved him in <coughs> participating in cold-blooded murder of surviving Jews um, in a way that was, um, when looked at in any ordinary eyes, um, truly um, terrible. Um, he took um, with other policemen um, five um, Jewish prisoners um, into the woods outside the village. Domachevo was the name of his village. And um, pressed a, a gun against the skull of each of them and, and pulled the trigger. <coughs> and difficult to imagine a more awful or cold-blooded way um, to execute um, people, particularly bearing in mind that numbers two, three, four and five, of course, had seen what's happened to those um, before them. Um, so um, what he did, and, and it was proved in the trial that he had done, although he denied it um, in his, um, his trial, um, was really quite unbelievable um, cruelty. Yet he was a man who had never committed any crime of any kind. And I venture to suggest that both Serovanovich and Sawonyuk, had there been no war, would have lived their entire lives entirely peacefully without committing any offence of any kind. And the same thing really um, happened um, in the Balkans War, which was a, a, a truly terrible um, conflict um, involving, um, as it did, um, genocide on a pretty terrifying scale. And um, I was um, instructed there to do the um, appeal in, in the um, first war crimes prosecution in an international setting um, since Nuremberg in 1946, which was when the UN set up the um, court for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. And the first person to be defended there was a man called Dusko Tadic. And um, I went to see him. Um, I met Tadic in the United Nations detention facility, which was a jail within a jail outside The Hague. I had to go through a Dutch jail to get to the detention center where the security was provided by UN guards. It smelt of stale cabbage, like all other prisons I have visited, but it was more peaceful than a normal prison with plenty of time for visits when families could make the journey. The relaxed atmosphere was fostered by the Irish governor who had managed to house prisoners from opposite sides of the conflict without any animosity that I could detect. Tadic seemed to be a gentle family man, like Serovanovich and Sawoniuk. He was not a general or politician who had ordered troops to engage in genocide or ethnic cleansing, but a low-ranked traffic policeman who had previously been a postman. Like many others who behaved barbarously during the war, he had lived a perfectly conventional life beforehand, exhibiting no signs of racial prejudice or anti-Muslim sentiments. Once the war started, however, he joined the Serbian para paramilitary force, which murdered Muslims in cold blood solely because of their religion. Tadic had been convicted of shooting two Muslim policemen in the head during an operation of ethnic cleansing through the territory of Prigidor in Bosnia. The Muslims in the towns and villages visited by the paramilitary force would have the men separated from the women and children and taken away to concentration camps. Frequently, though, the Muslims would receive prior warnings that the paramilitaries were on their way. 
and would evacuate to a safe place nearby. Two policemen who were Muslims were still in the town when the gunmen arrived. They were detained in the marketplace when Tadic was alleged to have walked up to them, put a pistol to their head and fired. This was seen by one witness, Nihad Serevich, a Muslim who had escaped before the paramilitaries arrived but had returned to the village in order to feed his pet pigeons. Tadic's conviction rested on his evidence alone. <clears throat> and there again um, was a case where a perfectly um, ordinary man, postman, then a traffic policeman, um, had killed two men in completely cold blood, having been caught up in, in a war where the propaganda was pitching religion against religion. And he had been living, as indeed most of the people who I came across in the Balkan conflicts, who had been charged with war crimes, had been living cheek by jowl with uh, peoples of other religions in perfect harmony <coughs> before the war began. And it's you know, quite extraordinary to me just how people were managed to be recruited to play such a part in the genocide that went on there. Um, after I um, did his case, um, I was asked to defend um, another Bosnian Serb called um, Goran Jelicic, um, who had been um, convicted of war crime, but in fact acquitted of genocide, who was in charge of one of the concentration camps where he would, um, it would appear for his own pleasure, um, torture and kill um, inmates who were Muslims. He, he was a, a slightly different um, individual, and I, I suspect um, was really a psychopath. He was a very um, cold and um, difficult to um, reason with individual, as opposed to Tadic, who had a delightful family who would come to visit him. Gave me a bottle of the most disgusting plum vodka I've ever had in my life <laughs> as a Christmas present one year. Um, whereas um, Jelicic um, was not, um, not such an attractive individual. Um, and then, finally, um, I acted for another man called um, Yusipovic. I mean, just to reflect on, on, on the allegations in his case, um, I was instructed to act in the appeal for Drago Yusipovic, a Bosnian Croat, convicted with four others of carrying out a blood-curdling attack on Armici, a small village in central Bosnia on the 16th of April 1993, more than a hundred civilian Muslim men, women and children were killed in the assault, which was part of a rampage by the Croatian military police, known as the Jokers, through Muslim settlements in the Lasla Valley. All 169 Muslim houses in the village were destroyed, along with two mosques. Not a single Croat home was torched. It's an um, incident in, in that war that, that has um, still to this day um, sent shockwaves through those who have read about it. As, um, as I say, more than 100 people were shot or burnt alive um, in that massacre. And yet he was a perfectly charming man who'd lived a perfectly law-abiding life um, up until the moment when that conflict began. So. Um, re reverting um, to the sort of theme of, of the talk, why do people um, commit murder? I think it's circumstance. Circumstance can put you in a position whereby people act in a way that they would never act otherwise. It can happen in a domestic setting. Um, it can happen as a result of um, war and international conflict. But it's not a crime that is committed generally by criminals in the sense of people who've been in trouble um, throughout their life with the police or anything like that. 
it's a crime that um, can be committed and statistically is most likely to be committed by the person you love, your neighbour, your partner, your parent or your child. So um, just reflect on that as we come to Christmas. <laughs> <coughs> Which is always statistically a high time <laughs> for murder which is more business for me. <laughs> um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, because I know you've all got jobs to do this afternoon, and I haven't. And um, <laughs> there's a, um, about um, 15 minutes left, and I'm very keen um, to take some questions. I, I've focused just on one aspect of um, my career and, and, and everything else. And I mean, there are, um, in, in the book, of course, um, quite a lot of um, examples of his characters of justice in a domestic setting. I don't think I've got time to go into those um, in any detail now, so you'll have to buy the book. Uh, those of you who haven't already got one, that is. But I'm very happy to take any, any questions at all, generally, not just about um, what I've spoken about today, but about the profession or anything else, um, if there are any. Hi, I was just wondering what you think about the kind of rising popularity of true crime um, and whether programmes like Making a Murderer or um, podcasts like Serial have been kind of useful from a justice, justice perspective or actually detrimental in terms of everyone weighing in with their own not necessarily informed opinion. Um, I did watch Making a, a murderer, but um, I'm afraid I hadn't got enough energy to see more than about the first two episodes. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a bit slow. Um, <laughs> but um, I, 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 don't, I think it's very difficult to, to actually equate that with a, with a real life. I know, I know it's a true story, but um, it seems so far removed um, to me from what, what we would come across as lawyers that I, I didn't really find it... Um, either very interesting um, or um, particularly helpful. Um, so I, I don't think that those sort of programmes really do any harm, but um, I really don't think they do any good at all. I think the programmes that um, do rather better are those that focus on a um, case um, where there's perhaps been a miscarriage of justice and um, explore what went wrong and, and, and why. And we've seen cases about um, the sort of Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six, um, Colin Stagg, um, they're doing one now about um, the Jill Dando case and Barry George um, that may be broadcast <coughs> early next year. And I think those sort of cases are, are probably better because they focus on a you know, particular crime and, and analyse that um, in, in a way that's more, um, more like an investigative um, bit of journalism than a sort of making a murderer that I, I just didn't like it very much. <laughs> did anyone else like it? I mean, what, did people like it? Yeah, they did. Yeah. No, no, no one liked it. <laughs> Gentlemen here, I know the question. I just wonder whether you think there should be a sort of statute of limitations for some of these crimes. I know you can yes. tax us up to six years, but you know, someone can remember it, something from 40 years ago. And it's, it's extremely difficult, um, a statute of limitations. Some countries do have it, of course. Um, I don't think that the quality of justice in the Second World War war crimes investigation was terribly high because I think so much evidence has been lost uh, over the years. And uh, my own personal view was that was too little, too late. But um, I do find that in some of these cases where you have um, paedophile cases where people have only been able to come forward after many years to describe what happened to them when they were children. Um, it seems to me that um, those sort of cases should be prosecuted because the reason they weren't prosecuted before was because the person accused had so terrified the victim that they hadn't got the ability, really, to complain before. So it's, it is difficult. But I mean, we're dealing with um, paedophile cases going back 40 years and more in the courts at the moment. And it is one of the growth areas for criminal justice. Um, not long ago, nearly a quarter of cases in the Crown Court involved some sort of crime of sexual, of sexual crime of some sort, either historic or current, which was an amazing statistic compared with 20 years ago.
Um, over the course of your career and the length of your career, you must have seen a huge change in both the use and sophistication of forensic evidence and that type of sort of, you know, DNA sampling and so on. I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on the extent to which it's improved or changed the, the sort of prosecution process. Um, well, DNA has made, been a fantastic um, aid to um, criminal investigations. Um, I mentioned briefly the Rachel and Akel murder in um, 1974, I think it was. Um, there, the man who had really murdered her was a man called Robert Knapper. Colin Stagg was undoubtedly completely innocent. And it was only years later when DNA profiling had uh, developed to such an extent that for the first time they were able to analyze a tiny DNA profile less left on Rachel Nickell's body by the murderer, that they were able to identify that profile as coming from Robert Knapper, who had by that time murdered another woman in very similar circumstances. Um, and th that's an illustration, if you like, of that crime being solved where it would never have been solved otherwise. Um, by DNA. Another case that's in the book, just by way of illustration, is a case of a man called Mark Dallager. Um, he was a rough justice case that I did, and he'd been convicted because of his ear print. Um, a woman was murdered in Huddersfield um, during a burglary, 96-year-old widow, smothered by a pillow, and the police found a perfect ear print on the outside window of the house. And the theory was that the burglar had put his ear to the window, couldn't hear anything, and had broken in. And a rather idiotic policeman from Holland called Van der Lug, if you believe it, um, <laughs> had given evidence that ear prints are unique, and it was Dallager's ear print. Well, he was convicted of murder on this daft evidence and spent about eight years there before I got involved in the case. The Court of Appeal overturned the verdict on the basis of fresh evidence. And again, it was DNA evidence that was not available at the time, but available then, that managed to extract a particle of DNA from the center of that ear print, which proved conclusively that whoever did it, it could not possibly be Mark Dallager. So there are two cases where they've really made a, a big contribution. Um, and I, I think now um, DNA is, is, is more valuable to crime detection than fingerprints. Um, it's, um, it, it's been a huge advance and it's enabled um, people who've been acquitted of crimes that they were guilty of years ago to be retried on fresh evidence and justice to be done when uh, the evidence just wasn't there before, which must be good for everybody. I just had a question. Presumably there's some of the people that you've been representing you've in... Um, faced intense press scrutiny uh, or scrutiny from the sort of court of public opinion. I just wondered how you dealt with that because uh, I'm sure people have, uh, have, have, have taken offence maybe to some of the people that you've represented or defended. Yes, I mean, um, the, well, the answer is that, that there has been a great deal of um, press interest in a lot of cases that I've done. Um, but I think, in a sense, the barristers are slightly protected um, from it, um, and I've certainly never had any personal um, criticism for defending in a case. And one thing we're always asked is, well, how can you defend somebody who you know is guilty? Um, and the, the answer to that question is a, quite a, an, an easy one to give, but it d requires just a moment's reflec reflection, really. We, we can't defend anybody who tells us that they are guilty. So I, if somebody comes to me and says, look, I did kill him, but I want you to get me off. I said, well, I can't defend you. You've either got to plead guilty or go, to, go somewhere else. I can't do it because you've told me you've done the crime. Um, and that is an absolute rule. However, if there is strong evidence against somebody, but they come to me and say, look, I, I don't know what the evidence looks like, but I tell you, I didn't do it, then we are not only able to defend him, there is, it's professionally required that we do defend him because we have something called the cab rank rule, um, which means rather like the taxi, we have to take the next case that we're given, that we are able to fit into our diary, 
and is being paid at the rate we normally charge, we cannot say, I don't like that case because it's got um, a lot of evidence against it, I think I'll lose, or I don't like the allegation, or I won't defend it because it's involving a rape, which I um, think is so awful I won't defend somebody. You have to take the next case, and that ensures that everybody, however heinous the crime that they've been accused of, will be defended by somebody, because unless they are, you've got no justice system at all. So it, it's the cab rank rule, it also protects us, because the answer to anybody who says, well, I was asked um, to do the case, and under the cab rank rule, I'm not allowed to refuse it. So it gives us a, a good get out as well. <laughs> oh, and after, after the next. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering, in your four to seven years, we talk about access to justice, and we see obviously a lot of coverage in the media around changes to legal aid and um, barristers taking industrial action and so on. And I'm very curious to hear your assessment of both access to and quality of justice and how that may have changed over the course of your career. Gosh, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, briefly, um, the uh, Ministry of Justice has suffered greater cuts by way of a percentage than any other department of government. Um, the, the cuts have been um, so deep that court buildings are now um, dilapidated. You can go to courts in London today, the lifts don't work, the carpets are threadbare, the lavatories are broken, the paint is peeling from the walls. It is a complete um, disgrace. If you go, as I do sometimes, to the third world and go to their courts, they are immaculately clean, spotless, and there is a pride in the fact that they're able to have such pristine courts that has long been lost here. Judicial, um, ju judicial morale is, is at an all-time low. They feel that they're not appreciated. Um, they're not um, given the rewards that they are titled to expect from their role. And the position in relation to publicly funded work as a barrister is now that the rewards are so low that it's beginning to impact on diversity in the profession. We have spent 40 years trying to ensure that people join the profession from all walks of life and that you can come in and earn a living defending uh, people accused of crime. We're now rapidly approaching the, the point when unless you've got a private income um, or um, a partner who is a high earner, you just cannot afford to be a publicly funded defence advocate. And I think that's a, a real tragedy. But um, I'm afraid to say um, that is the truth. Uh, barristers' fees have been cut by well over 50% in the last eight years, which is extraordinary. Just imagine what had happened if they'd done that to nurses. I mean, it doesn't bear thinking about. You had a question. Don't worry. <laughs> um, you speak quite a lot about murder and all mm. the kind of different cases there, but do you cover all criminal cases? And if so, yes. is there a particular case or crime that you enjoy defend? Enjoy is probably not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think there probably is. I mean, what I've actually done most of in recent years is not murder at all. What I've done most of is to defend in um, commercial um, criminal fraud trials, normally with an international perspective. So. For example, the last two big trials I've done was to defend um, the managing director of a, a huge multinational um, engineering company called Alstom for um, alleged corruption in India over the building of the Paris Metro and in Warsaw over the construction of the tram system there. Um, and that's the sort of um, case that I do mostly and I find that much more interesting in a way. It's a great challenge to understand the industry. Before that, um, I defended the people who were setting the LIBOR rate for Barclays Bank um, in the LIBOR. So those are the sort of things I do mostly. Um, they don't make for a good book, particularly. Um, <laughs> but there is one, one in there about a, a, um, a fraud case um, involving a mining company in, in, in um, North America, um, in the Montana, involving a, the Butte Mining Company. But um, 
Yes, that, that's what I do mostly. I haven't done a murder case for years and probably never do another one. Um, but uh, that was where I learnt my skills, as it were, doing general crime. I have a pretty loud voice, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, what made you pursue criminal law over the other disciplines when you started out? Oh, I always wanted to be a criminal. I think it was watching Perry Mason um, on, on the telly. Um, I used to watch it every week and he never lost a case. Sadly, it doesn't <laughs> transfer into real life. But what, what always attracted me more than anything else was the oral advocacy. And you do more of that in a criminal court with a criminal practice than any other area of the law. And I, I also found it fascinating, and I, and I, and I still do. I mean, um, there are plenty of barristers who do different types of law, but um, f for me, I was always um, set on crime. <laughs> and I don't regret it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, William. <coughs> uh, William Blake.